now. So let's continue with infection. And we're talking about treatment for infection. So typically for bacterial infections, the treatment is antibiotics. And antibiotics carry with them side effects. Some of them are more annoying than anything else, but some of them can be harmful. So one of the biggest problems is, is that all those good and bad bacteria that you have in your gut, and when we say gut, we're talking about your small intestines and your large intestines. Um, the antibiotics will destroy some of those necessary bacteria. And the problem with that is the good bacteria get destroyed too. The harmful bacteria can increase in numbers and that can cause inflammation, watery stool, it's like nasty diarrhea. Um, it can even progress to something called pseudomembranous colitis, which is here on this slide, okay? We're not gonna worry about whether they're gram positive or negative, but there's an overgrowth of the, the you know, an imbalance in your normal gut, you know, um, um, bacteria. Pseudomembranous colitis, life-threatening condition, may result and that can cause C. diff. So pseudomembranous colitis is basically the worst diarrhea, watery, frequent, um, sometimes tinged with mucus, sometimes tinged with blood. <clears throat> if a patient experiences that when they're on antibiotics, they need to stop that antibiotic and call the doctor, okay? That is the case where call the doctor is the right answer because this can actually, especially with older people, very old, very young, they're fragile. Somebody can become dehydrated almost instantly. So, you know, a couple hours of this type of diarrhea, they can wind up in the hospital, <clears throat> which is what we don't want. <clears throat> so Clostridium difficile, is the, that's the overgrowth of those bad bacteria. It's transmitted oral fecal. In other words, it's, it's found in the stools. You must wash your hands. You can't use alcohol-based rubs. We're gonna stop that antibiotic that you're on and the treatment that I want you to know about, and this is one of the meds that we're gonna go over and farm tomorrow, is metronidazole, also known as flagyl. I'm gonna get rid of Vanco, okay? Metronidazole, flagyl is the drug of choice for C. diff, okay? And we'll talk about some of the side effects. Metronidazole is one of those meds that can turn the patient's urine brown. And that is a very important detail that you need to tell your patient about because imagine if you started on a, on a medication and all of a sudden, every time you go pee, the urine's this dark brown color. You would be worried if you didn't know that it was a, an expected side effect of that drug, right? So. When we start talking about these particular meds, I'll tell you just the stuff that you need to know about those meds. So metronidazole turns the urine a really like reddish brown color. Um, and the patient needs to know about that. It's the drug of choice for C. diff. Okay. And moving on. Oops, too far. We're not going to talk about this. You don't need to know it. Nope. Nursing responsibilities. Whenever we're talking about medication administration, it's your job to make sure that the patient is not allergic to the drug, to teach them about side effects, adverse effects, check for signs of super infection, which would be like candidiasis, you know, like the vaginal yeast infection or oral thrush. And then to monitor levels of the drug in their bloodstream if it's appropriate, okay? So when we talk about, and I'll talk more about this with the farm lectures. Um, when we talk about medications, I can't stress this enough. You must always ask a patient about allergies every time you give them a med. Because here is what will happen. Patient comes into urgent care, they're sick, they don't feel well. Do you have any allergies, Mrs. Jones? No. But then a little while later, you go to give Mrs. Jones her meds. Do you have any allergies? Oh, wait a minute. I think the doctor told me years ago that I was allergic to whatever. You see my point? 
So people, you know, don't always give you the whole story. They don't always remember. So you want to make sure that you're asking these questions all the time, especially the question about allergies, because an allergic reaction to a med can kill someone. Okay. And again, we'll talk more about that in farm. So it's your responsibility. Um, years ago, when people became nurses, you know, they could say, well, the doctor told me to do it. And that was a legitimate excuse. Like my ex-mother-in-law became an RN in the 1930s. Okay. Long time ago. When she became an RN, there was no LPN program. Uh, there was no college. There was no pharmacology. You went to the hospital and you became what's called a candy striper. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. So you would dress up in this ridiculous pinafore dress with pink and white stripes. So you kind of looked like a piece of candy. And you would do all the dirty work. You'd empty the bedpans and the catheters and you'd clean the floors and you would bring the coal for the heater. You'd make the beds. You'd do all the dirty work. And it would be like your training. And by the way, here's a fun fact. Back then, if a doctor entered the room, you had to stand up and give him your seat. I don't think I would have lasted five minutes. I'd have been like, I don't think so. Anyway, things were very different. So back then, if a doctor said, I want you to give Mrs. Jones such and such medication, you would blindly follow that order. Now that doesn't fly because you have a license and you have been educated, right? So a uh, quick story. Dennis Quaid, he's an actor. Um, he hasn't done a lot lately, but he was in a movie, um, A Dog's Life. I don't know, it was that like a year or two ago? Anyway, back in the 90s, he and his wife, they um, had a set of twins. They had a set of twins. And the twins were born prematurely, and they were on heparin. Heparin is an anticoagulant. It stops your blood from clotting. Long story short, the doctor and the pharmacy got the wrong dose. The nurse didn't check and administered the wrong dose that almost killed these babies. It was all over the news. Every hospital was freaking out going, we can't let nurses give heparin anymore. We need three nurses to co-sign it. When so you understand that the ultimate responsibility you're the last line of defense between your patient and the morgue. Doctors make mistakes a lot. Pharmacists make mistakes. Before you give any medication, you always, always three checks to make sure you're given the right med, right patient, right dose, right time, right route, all that stuff, okay? Um, because the responsibility ultimately will be on you. Even if the doctor screwed up and the pharmacist screwed up, you gave it, right? So you're responsible. So you don't want to hurt anybody, I promise. You don't want that on your conscience. So always check to make sure allergies, patient history, and all those important um, details from your patient, okay? Okay. Uh, da, da, da. They should always take medication as prescribed, and they should always report any side effects I'm going to say with this report side effects um, that are not um, harmless. So in other words, like with the metronidazole, the patient's urine is going to turn brown. They don't need to tell you that, right? Because we already know that that's going to happen and it's not hurting them. So they're not going to call my, my urine. Every time I pee, it's brown. We know, right? But anything else that could be harmful, they should report, right? So make sure that you know that. Nursing diagnoses, there are a couple thrown in there for your viewing pleasure. Um, for respiratory tract infections, I just want to talk about a sputum culture real quick. Uh, and that's about it. With a sputum culture, just make sure that you understand we're not culturing their saliva, right? It's not their spit. We are culturing their sputum. In other words, <clears throat> did y'all get that? 
there's sputum. So you and and when we do a sputum culture, we are concerned probably that they may have respiratory MRSA or some significant type of, you know, either viral or bacterial pneumonia. So we need to get respiratory secretions for a sputum culture from down deep. So make sure that you understand that that's not something you can't get that from a swab. Any questions so far? Mute, please. Thank you. All right. All right. We're going to wrap this up. Let's see. Respiratory infections, make sure they cough and deep breathe. I already told you, right? Smell the roses. Smell the roses. And then blow out the candles. Okay, don't forget that. I don't forget that. Um, make sure that they're using the proper type of um, oral care because that's important. Make sure they're hydrated. The other thing you need to know when it comes to hydration, the reason that we tell people with respiratory tract infections to force fluids is because we want to make sure that whatever secretions they have, they get liquefied. So the more that the patient drinks, it'll help to liquefy the secretions, which makes them easier for the patient to expectorate. Okay? So that's important. And let's see. <clears throat> And then how's the patient doing? Is there shortness of breath relieved? And does everybody know that dyspnea means shortness of breath? Shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. We also say SOB and we don't mean son of a bitch. We mean shortness of breath. A normal oxygen saturation. I'm going to talk about this real quick too. Is anything above 90%? not 95. And I know that somewhere along the lines, people have heard 95%. No. Oxygen saturation, when you put a pulse ox on a patient's finger, anything greater than 90, they're okay. Now, if it's 90 to 95, I'm a little concerned because what's going to happen when they start moving around, it's going to drop even more probably, right? So that's a little concerning, but it's not considered abnormal. Anything less than 90 would be abnormal. And one more thing. When you put a pulse ox on a patient, please don't use that for their pulse. Ever, ever, ever. Because older people have all types of circulatory issues just from the aging process. So what you're seeing on the pulse ox, reading it from their finger, is not what's happening apically. You always do an apical for a full minute when you're assessing a patient. And furthermore, if that pulse ox, let's say you stick the pulse ox on me right now, and it says 72. Look at your patient. Do I look like my pulse ox is 72? No, right? I'm not blue, cyanotic. I'm not short of breath. I'm not, you know, I'm not in distress. 72%, I'd be almost dead. Okay, so look at your patient and make sure that, you know, you're not just taking the word of an electronic device because batteries could be bad. The patient may have poor circulation, so it's not getting a good reading from the capillary bed in the patient's finger. Lots of things can go wrong. So make sure that you look at your patient. If it says 72 and the patient looks like this, you're going to say that's wrong, right? And you're going to listen to lungs and, and, and assess the patient. Okay, so make sure you remember that. And to finish up with infection, because I'm tired of talking about infection. Um, for GI infections, we kind of already talked about them. Make sure they don't get dehydrated. We may need a culture of their stool. Of their stool. Um, nursing diagnoses, risk for infection. Make sure they're hydrated. And evaluation, make sure that they don't have any GI symptoms, diarrhea, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing for genitourinary tract infections. Um, what are the signs and symptoms? And I'm just going to add in here for you guys, if the computer is going to let me, come on. Dysuria, which is painful urination, and polyuria. Here we go. So, so 
So DY, whenever you see DYS in front of something, just think of dysfunctional family, right? DYS means it's not working right. So dysuria means painful urination. And um, polyuria, poly means many, means they're peeing all the time. So there's some signs and symptoms, right, of a urinary tract infection. And catheters are the number one reason why people get urinary tract infections, believe it or not. And then what I told you before about older ladies and not wiping correctly, okay? We don't put a catheter in somebody unless we absolutely must. Unless we absolutely must, okay? Um, all right, so these are some review questions. I'll leave those on here. Oh, localized versus generalized. Okay, I'll talk about this real quick. Um, when we talk about the infectious process, an infection is either localized or it's generalized. In other words, I cut my finger and I don't wash it right away. And then the next day I look at it and it's erythematous, red and swollen and it hurts. And there's some purulent exudate oozing from it. And by the way, we don't use the word pus. We're nurses. We use purulent exudate. That's pus. So it looks like it's infected, right? That's a localized infection. The finger's infected. But what if nobody notices? If no one notices, that localized infection can then spread and become a generalized infection. So you've all heard the term sepsis or the patient went septic, septic shock, right? So septicemia, what that means is they had a local infection that somehow either didn't respond to treatment or nobody noticed it and didn't treat it. And now it's gone systemic. It's throughout their whole body, their bloodstream. And they will have signs and symptoms like possibly a fever, possibly, not always. Helpful hint, old people don't move around much. Oftentimes when you check an older person's temperature, it's going to be a little low. So normal temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Older people, you may get 97.2 or 1. So, you know, a fever is not always the best way to determine whether someone is infected or not. They might have, an, they might have a fever. They might not have a fever, okay? Um, but they will have other signs and symptoms like malaise, the word malaise basically means I just feel crappy, right? I feel, I don't feel well, malaise. Lethargy, somebody's lethargic. They don't feel like moving around. They just, they lay there, right? That's a sign of a generalized infection. Fatigue, anorexia, not anorexia nervosa, just anorexia. Anorexia means loss of appetite. So they'll lose their appetite. They'll feel generally crappy. They won't feel like moving. They'll feel tired all the time. And oftentimes they will have what's called pallor. That's P-A-L-L-O-R. Pallor means that they look like, like a vampire, suck the blood out of them, right? Looks like the, their color is all out. Doesn't matter if they're black, white, what ethnicity they are. You can look at somebody who is exhibiting pallor and tell that they look just, you know, exhausted. These are all signs of a generalized infection, which can be dangerous and, you know, can kill someone, especially the very old and the very young because they're more fragile, okay? And, oh, no, I don't want that. I want... We are done with this, aren't we? Yep, there's a question about immunity plan a care question and okay hallelujah we're done with infection so the slides that you don't need in here i'm going to go ahead and delete and then i'm going to save it and i'm going to put it up for you guys okay so let's take a little quick break what time is it one o'clock um take a little quick break you guys all should have done that little quiz that i put up so during the break grab that quiz 
Okay. Can you put that back? Sure. Thank you. 